Good afternoon, and welcome to Canadian Urban Institute's Excess Soil Bylaw Tool webinar. So our speakers for today's session, um, speaking is Amanda Smith. I am a director at the Canadian Urban Institute, and I'm joined by my colleague, Geneva Starr, who is an engineering researcher at the Institute. And we're pleased to have a special guest speaker today with us, uh, Sanjay Coelho, a senior policy analyst from the Land and Water Policy Branch at the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. So just quickly about the Canadian Urban Institute. We were established in 1990 as Canada's Applied Urban Policy Institute. We're a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization, and our work supports the development of practical, creative, and scalable solutions to support ecologically, socially, and economically healthy towns, cities, and regions. Okay, so what are we talking about today? Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction on the topic of, of soils and excess soils and bylaws and um, the context around our excess soil bylaw tool. And then we'll walk you through the tool. So we'll go on the website and um, show you some of the features of the bylaw tool and uh, how it can be used. And then Sanjay is going to walk through the excess soil management policy framework. And then we'll have time for questions and answers. So. Um, feel free to type questions into the dialog box as you go, and uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can at the end. If we don't get to your questions, um, we will take them into account, and um, you can contact us by email, or there's also a contact box on the Access Soils website where we'd love to hear your comments. Um, so today is really the official launch of this bylaw tool, and uh, we look forward to hearing your feedback and, and comments on it. Okay, so the first question is, what is excess soil? Um, so the Ministry of the Environment's Best Management Practices, which we'll talk more about, uh, defines soil, excess soil as soil that has been excavated, mainly during construction activities, that uh, cannot or will not be reused at the site where the soil was excavated and must be moved off-site. Um, so you see a picture of a, a big hole here, and excess soil is essentially soil that um, has been removed from an excavation, uh, best practices, say that it's reused on site, but a lot of times that's not possible. And so the soil becomes excess to the site and must be accommodated elsewhere. And uh, what is soil? So for the purposes of today's discussion, we're talking about clean soil. Uh, the BMP defines clean soil with reference to the Environmental Protection Act. And so just to be clear, we're not talking about things like um, waste materials, asphalt, concrete, garbage, shingles. Um, there are uh, processes in place to manage those, those kinds of materials, but for the purpose of today, we're talking about uh, clean soils. Okay, so why is this an issue? Why is excess soil an issue? Um, so due to significant amounts of construction, buildings, transportation, sewer, and water main works, uh, there are large quantities of soil being generated that cannot be reused on site and must be taken to another site. Municipalities want to ensure that the importation of soil does not have an adverse effect on the environment, so it doesn't have an adverse effect on soil and water quality, or on the community, so things like noise and dust and truck traffic. And municipal bylaws provide a means uh, for municipalities to ensure these things are taken care of or managed. Um, Section 142 of the Municipal Act gives municipalities specific authority to regulate certain fill activities. And so they can use the bylaw as the main instrument uh, by which they manage soil issues. All right, which brings us to the excess soil bylaw tool. So just a bit of background. Uh, we were retained by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs last year to develop an interactive web-based site alteration bylaw language tool. And the intent is to help Ontario municipalities with cost-effective and consistent bylaw development and better implementation of the Ministry's best management practices. Uh, this tool was launched in September of 2016. And I uh, just want to issue a bit of a disclaimer here. Um, while we certainly made best efforts to provide um, research and useful information uh, through the bylaw tool, um, we really encourage you to um, take what we have provided and then obtain your own technical and uh, legal uh, advice on that. Uh, we also provide links to various third-party websites, and these links are provided as a convenience and not as a specific endorsement of, of things that we've linked to. So just a general disclaimer uh, before we get into the content. 
Okay. So the intent here is to incorporate principles of the ministry's best management practices. Um, the best management practices was a, a guideline uh, developed by the Ministry of the Environment that was released in 2014 and is available on the website or is available on the internet and uh, a copy of the, the cover is shown there. And the BMP provides guidance on how to handle excess soil, uh, beginning where the soil is excavated, which uh, is called the source site, uh, during transportation and through to where it can be reused for a beneficial purpose. So that is the receiving site. And you'll hear us refer to uh, source sites and receiving sites through this conversation. And then the second intent of this uh, bylaw tool is to respond to common issues that have been faced by municipalities on soil receiving sites. So our process for developing this tool is um, to identify some of those key issues. We had uh, conducted interviews with um, municipalities, the Ontario government, industry associations, qualified persons, and uh, NGOs. And uh, we identified uh, issues from the Ministry's best management practices and the excess soil regulation uh, policy framework and reviewed over 80 Ontario site alteration and fill bylaws. Okay, so now we'll get into the tool. Um, so we identified uh, 19 issues um, that are presented on the tool. And for each one, you'll see these, um, these icons. So in the, the gray text is uh, things to consider. So these are things you might want to keep in mind when you're looking at um, how to respond to uh, an issue identified. Uh, in the plain text is, is sample bylaw language that is copied from um, other um, uh, bylaws and presented as an example. And then uh, recommendations from the ministry's best management practices are provided in blue text. And that's copied directly from the BMP and produced um, to help provide guidance. And then uh, resources and examples are provided in the uh, brown text. And that includes things like uh, case law and other resources that uh, might be useful when addressing the issues. Um, so in this webinar, we'll briefly discuss a select few of the issues that we think are key to understanding how to make an effective site alteration bylaw, and uh, really the intent is to show you um, how this website works. Okay, so bylaws are typically organized into um, a number of sections, and these 15 sections are provided here. And uh, we point this out because on each of the issues pages, we provide information within these um, typical bylaw sections. So if you're looking at an issue page, you might wonder why we've chosen to present things in a certain order. And uh, it's because we're trying to lay it out as it would in a typical bylaw. So you'll see these, these section headers repeat throughout the website. Um, so now we will uh, take you to the website. Okay, so now we are on the website. So this is the uh, home page of the website here. So I'll just scroll through. Um, so on the website, it provides the issues on the right here that the website addresses. And across the top, there's a navigation pane. So the issues, again, drop down from this issues tab. And so I'd like to start by showing you this municipal bylaws tab. So as I mentioned, we gathered a number of municipal bylaws um, for this um, exercise, and we provided them here on the website. And so you can click on the municipality that you're looking at, a box will pop up and it tells you the revision date of the bylaw and a link to access the bylaw. So because um, this issue of excess soil has tended to take place around Toronto, we really focused on bylaws uh, surrounding Toronto. So there has been a lot of development in and around Toronto and the GTA with soil moving outwards um, to make a kind of large generalization about what, what's been happening with soil movement. So the focus of this resource so far has been around Toronto, but the intent is to expand outwards, uh, include the Ottawa region and other municipalities in Ontario. So this can continue to be a growing resource. Um, as well, we have the Conservation Authority regulations as well that pertain to soil management activities uh, shown on this map here that can also be accessed. 
Okay, so the first page I'd like to show you on the website is the definitions page. So this page includes uh, 21 key terms that um, we believe should be defined in a site alteration or fill bylaw and provides references for how they are defined. So that would be the source documents, uh, regulations, or acts that the definitions are taken from. Um, so it's important to carefully define the terms in the bylaw because they really form the structure for the rest of the document and um, yeah, set out kind of the parameters of the bylaw. And um, the definitions here are provided as an example, but again, needs to be drafted um, so the language coordinates with, with everything else you're trying to achieve in the bylaw. So just a few terms that we highly recommend be defined in a bylaw um, based on our research is uh, things like adverse effect, uh, contaminant, contaminated fill, excess soil, qualified person, and soil. So uh, quite a few definitions here. I won't scroll through them all, but uh, is a good first place to start on the website. Okay, so the next issue we'll talk about is permits. So um, every bylaw that we reviewed uh, had a permit requirement, and um, most municipalities require a permit to be obtained before beginning site alteration activities. And uh, permits allow municipalities to have greater control and oversight into the management of excess soil, and generally contain a detailed list of requirements for submission with the permit application. Um, one point to note, though, is that uh, most municipalities also include exemptions for smaller volumes. So you're not going to require people to get a permit for things like landscaping or installing a fence. Um, but over a certain volume, and um, if not including those kinds of, of um, small activities, then a permit is a, is a good practice to require to make sure the bylaw can be enforced. Okay. The next one we'll look at is large-scale site alteration agreements. So this is uh, going, I guess, one step further beyond a typical permit. Um, so large-scale site alterations uh, may be delineated. So this is a, a larger volume based on the volume placed, uh, based on the change in grade and elevation, and often over a, a certain time period. So we've included some sample definitions here for large-scale site alterations. And in addition to uh, the typical permit requirements, it is a best practice to include a more detailed list of submittals for a large-scale site alteration. So some examples of the kinds of things that should be provided or included here. Um, they include things like a fill management plan, which uh, Geneva is going to talk more about to ensure the quality of the incoming fill, um, requirements for groundwater monitoring, um, grading and site plan, mud and dust control measures, erosion and sedimentation control, uh, truck traffic requirements, which we'll talk more about in the transportation management plan, uh, public meetings, default provisions if the, um, uh, the site alteration is not carried out as agreed, um, requirements for liability insurance. So there are quite a range of requirements that are best practice to include in a bylaw so that all of the um, components of the site alteration can be accounted for. Okay, um, which brings us to our next issue of commercial fill operations. So um, commercial fill operations are often defined as a, a, by a certain volume of soil. Um, some municipalities also just define a commercial fill operation as when there is remuneration paid for the importation of soil. So if there's money involved for soil placement, then that is sometimes uh, defined or classified as a commercial fill operation. So in addition to the issues uh, for a large-scale site alteration that we talked about, the importance of having a, a fill management plan and all of those other requirements, um, we did hear some specific concerns from municipalities when managing commercial fill operations, and we've included those here. Um, so those are things like complaints. So a best practice would be to have a complaint mechanism in place so that if there are issues with the operation, the community um, knows who to call and knows what the response process will be to respond to complaints. Um, as well as traffic and transportation, so we'll get into the traffic and transportation management plan. And public consultation is a best practice. Um, so we'll go to the consultation and engagement tab here. So the ministry's best management practices 
um, recommends uh, as a best practice engaging the public on any proposed fill operation, and that's especially important on a commercial fill operation. So we provide um, sample bylaw language text for how to advertise and um, uh, hold a, a public consultation on a, on a commercial fill operation. And the last major issue that we heard um, for commercial fill operations is cost recovery. So especially for a small municipality, uh, recovering the costs of both approving and administering a commercial fill operation, and as well as making sure they have money in place um, for security deposits for roads, or if the project is not completed as planned, um, is really important. And so that brings me to the last issue I'm going to talk about here, which is fees, cost recovery, and financial assurance. Oh, and let me pull it up here. Okay, so in the bylaws we reviewed, municipalities use quite a range of means to make sure that the costs of administering site alterations are covered. And so these are these appear in the order that they would appear in a bylaw here, um, but include things like um, having permit fees, having fees for revising or extending a permit, um, recovering costs for obtaining the technical consultants necessary to oversee such a project, um, and then also penalties for failing to comply with a work order or unauthorized uh, site alteration uh, work and deposits, so general security deposits and road security deposits. Um, so there's a lot of detail here, but really just pointing this out because there are a range of mechanisms by which municipalities uh, can build into the bylaw to cover the costs of administering uh, site alterations in their jurisdiction. And um, a best practice to point out here is that um, well, you know, the Municipal Act does allow municipalities to recover these kinds of costs. A best practice is to make sure that they are actual estimates of the costs that will be incurred. Um, so the best, yeah, best estimate that you can make of the actual costs a municipality will incur and then building those into the bylaw. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to Geneva to talk about the fill management plan. Okay, thanks, Amanda. So as she's mentioned um, a few times, the fill management plan um, is a way to help ensure that the excess fill being brought into your municipality is um, properly managed. So the best practice of, um, of this is to require receiving sites to have a fill management plan prior to allowing the excess soil to be transferred to the site, but after a site assessment has deemed the site is suitable to receive soils. Uh, so essentially, a fill management plan is a plan that firstly outlines the existing conditions of the receiving site, and then secondly, the intended operations of that site. Um, and it should be developed by a qualified person. Um, the MOECC best management practices actually outline specific components that a fill management plan uh, should include, and we also list these on our website here. Um, so as you can see, it's the BMP is quite thorough here um, in what they require. One important thing we'd like to point out is this traffic and transportation management plan um, that we've mentioned before and uh, we will further discuss in a moment. Um, but basically, the objective of a fill management plan is to have a robust method to ensure that excess soil brought to a site does not cause any adverse effects on the environment or the community. Um, so environmentally, some concerns may be introduction of invasive species or soil and water contam contamination from improperly tested soils or poorly managed erosion control. And then within a community, um, residents are often concerned with dust and noise, um, air quality issues, and then municipalities um, have concerns about potential infrastructure damage from the trucks. So as I mentioned, that infrastructure damage uh, a best practice is to try and manage that through the traffic and transportation plan. So uh, not many existing bylaws actually require a fill management plan um, as of yet, and the ones that do are not necessarily consistent with each other, but from what we found, um, we, it should be put under the requirement for an issuance of a permit. And what we've seen as an effective, method, an effective method is actually referring to the MOECC BMP within the bylaws here. So then 
that's just ensuring that you're actually capturing all of those thorough components that they've listed. And as well, it helps build consistency between bylaws um, if other bylaws are also referencing that BMP. So finally, when looking at uh, the requirement for a fill management plan, it's also important to uh, have a penalty clause uh, if requirements are not properly fulfilled. So this just means that um, you will have funds adequate to uh, rehabilitate sites if the fill management plan was not enacted properly or potentially cover uh, court fees. So going back to the traffic and transportation issue, um, we actually have that as a separate issue on the site because we've heard uh, it's a big concern for municipalities and ensuring that the bylaw uh, manages this. Um, I think specifically with large scale site alterations, um, there is the potential that traffic and transportation from the site alteration activities can have significant impacts on the community and uh, the municipal infrastructure. So as mentioned uh, previously, it's the noise and dust, um, it's the potential road damage, and then also there's the issue of truck tracking to make sure that um, the soil that you're getting is the is the soil that you think you're getting from the place you think you're getting it from, and as well, you're, you know which roads are actually being used to transport that soil. So, um, as recommended by the MOECC best management practices, um, you should require a traffic and transportation plan, and again, that's part of the fill management plan requirements. So, on the site, we've listed here the components that the BMP recommends. So, Having the site operator plan the location configuration of site entrances, truck queuing and parking, dust control and mud tracking, and then haul routes between source sites, receiving sites, and temporary soil storage sites um, if you're using those. So just on that note, actually, we've one of our definitions for this um, is electronic tracking because we think it's a good practice that um, if possible, you require or you require GPS or digital tracking where possible. Um, again, just so you know where those trucks are going and um, where the soil is coming from. Okay, so um, outside of actually having a traffic and transportation plan, you can um, bylaws can also have specific clauses for these key issues of road damage and noise and dust. Um, for example, under general prohibitions and regulations, or I scrolled too far. So we have, like I said, the road damage. Um, so you can actually prohibit uh, jumping on a lot, fronting on a town road, unsuitable for transportation of fill, um, obviously at the discretion of the director of municipality. So you can actually um, identify roads that are more vulnerable to truck traffic and say that there's no jumping allowed near there. And then for noise and dust, we've seen it's good practice to actually outline when and when not trucks can uh, be running on the road. So for example, here we have, you can't run them between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. Um, and you can also add a day or the weekend if you think it's beneficial to the community to restrict uh, truck traffic during certain days. For dust, um, here we have conditions based on weather, so not running trucks during a wind warning or during smog advisory uh, or during a certain time after a rain event. Uh, we also see these issues addressed under requirements for issuance of a permit, and through our consultation, we actually found five uh, key issues for uh, permit requirements, um, one compliance with Ministry of Transportation, road damage, mud tracking, dust control, um, how to implement that traffic and transportation management plan, and large-scale operations. So we've addressed these on our site. Again, compliance with Ministry of Transportation, obviously you want the haul operations to do that. Road damage, another uh, permit requirement can be to minimize the damage or require that any damage is rehabilitated by the applicant. Um, mud tracking dust control, you can require a mud tracking dust control program. 
And then getting back to this traffic and transportation management plan. So this would be a requirement of issuance of the permit. And what we found is good practice. Um, similar to the film management plan is you can actually refer back to the um, BMP management of excess soil best management practices for similar reasons that you're capturing those best practices and that you're building consistency uh, within bylaws. So these first two examples both reference to BMP. This one spells it out uh, a little more there. And then two other things you want to consider with, uh, well, okay, sorry, large-scale operations, again, similar to fill management plan. Um, obviously, there is a potentially greater risk with the larger-scale operations. So you may want to include some more um, onerous requirements to add on to that traffic and transportation management plan, as these two examples do. And then uh, two other things to consider would be um, record keeping and inspection, administration, and enforcement. And this is just to allow the municipality to monitor any potential damage or dust and noise, and then also enforce the bylaw. And finally, um, costs. So as we've discussed, one of the biggest concerns for municipality is having the available funds to manage and enforce the bylaw, um, specifically with traffic and transportation. Um, the risk of road damage can have a significant um, costs. So because of this, it's important to include a clause under fees that allows the director and municipality to determine required fees if proper maintenance and or rehabilitation is not undertaken by the applicant. So we think it's important that it's determined by the director on a site-by-site -site basis because the scale of operation will ultimately affect the, the size of the potential risk. And as Amanda said, um, for fees, you want to use the best estimate of actual anticipated cost um, because that's what you're going to be able to uh, back up more rigorously. So that, I think, finishes us with a brief tour of our website, um, and we're now going to bring you back to the presentation. Okay, so we gave you a, a tour through a few of the key issues. Um, here's a number of other issues that are available on the website, so um, feel free to take a look at those. Um, and uh, let us know if you have any comments on those. And which brings us to uh, the last slide or part of the website we wanted to point out is there is this contact form um, where we'd like to hear your comments as you hopefully uh, make use of the website. Um, so with that, uh, we'd like to turn the presentation over to Sanjay Coelho from the Ministry of the Environment to talk about the Excess Soil Policy Management Framework. Okay, well, thank you, Amanda. And before I start, I think I really should congratulate CUI for completing this tool with uh, some funding from the MMA, and it's very much appreciated as a, you know, bringing us to speed with the BMP and helping implementation. And, I, you know, I'm reminded myself of the depth and uh, of the work that's been done, so that's really great. So I'm Sanjay Quayle. I'm one of the team members from the Land and Water Policy Branch um, leading the development of excess soil policy on behalf of the Ministry of the Environment and working with other ministries and key organizations like the Canadian Urban Institute. So basically, uh, we're talking about the excess soil management policy framework. This is giving the bigger picture upon which the, um, the CUI's tool is an important part. So first, I'm gonna talk about the excess soil management policy framework. I'm gonna give context and a bit ch chat at high level about a regulatory proposal that we are working on. Then we'll talk about next steps and we'll give some contact info. So on December 16th, 2016, uh, the final excess soil management policy framework was posted on the environmental registry. And this framework has two overarching goals, to protect human health and the environment uh, from the inappropriate relocation of excess soil and to enhance opportunities for beneficial reuse of that excess soil and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so, you know, what we've talked about in the framework is things like we have observed soil going large distances um, to be disposed of some in, in many cases 
in locations that are less than ideal. So these two goals really are complementary of each other. If you are uh, beneficially reusing soil, then I think that that intuitively means it's not being inappropriately relocated. And if you're using it close to source uh, while you're beneficially reusing it, that complements the ministry's objectives with regards to climate change, which is a good thing. So the, I, I will point out that the framework document was the product of two years of work, really. Uh, we started in January 2014 at the same time that the BMP was released. So you have the BMP, which is one critical piece, uh, and Amanda and Geneva have talked about the BMP. Uh, you also had the start of our policy needs review again in January 2014. And the needs review was two years of work, um, and a number of folks on the line fed into that work. We chatted with a number of you. Uh, I did look at the attendance list before we started. So your input to that process was very much appreciated. We did a wide range of work to look at the need for um, basically additional or improved excess soil management policy and found a compelling need for additional and improved excess soil management policy. So the outcome is a 40-page document um, that we can, you know, that is publicly available and, um, you know, it's the MOECC's excess soil management policy framework. This was finalized in December. It includes 21 key actions, and those actions are essentially broken down into the key facets, if you will, of soil management. Source sites, receiving sites, what we're called interim sites, uh, planning for beneficial reuse of soil, and things like integration and implementation. So I want to point out that this document is not policy unto itself. It's a strategic plan document. Um, so it's not to be confused with a regulation, let's say. It's signaling an intent to create a regulation. Uh, so let's talk about that then. Some of the key actions anticipated for early delivery include the development of a new source site regulation, which would be supported by complementary amendments to existing regulations, including the waste regulation, Ontario's Record of Site Condition Regulation, aka the Brownfields Regulation, and the Building Code. And so, so that you can follow along with this story, this is Actions 1 for the regulation, Action 2 for the tie into the Building Code, and Action 18, which speaks to revising our uh, Record of Site Condition Regulation, which relates to Brownfields, and our Waste Regulation, uh, to complement and support the, the rollout of an improved soil management policy regime. The development of standards and sampling guidance for excess soil to support the new source site regulation. Uh, so essentially the standards that would indicate what is a, a appropriate relocation to the receiving site, um, you know, supporting beneficial reuse, and the sampling that can help you arrive at those conclusions as well. And then other non-mandatory ac activities to support uh, delivery, including a online registry for excess soil movement and the establishment of various working groups. One thing we'll say about the registry so that you know, uh, as, as we contemplate in the BMP, actually a consideration is being given to tying that to the soil management regulation and the need to do a soil management plan. And I want to situate CUI's good work within this broader world of excess soil work. Action 8 speaks to the development of a bylaw language tool to support municipalities in developing or updating ex, uh, bill or site alteration management plans. So you will see in the framework that there is a very important role uh, still contemplated for these site alteration uh, bylaws in the future. What we, we have seen over the years, a, uh, a number of municipalities have them. We've seen, again to use the good word, compelling, a compelling amount of discontinuity between them. They're not all consistent. Um, you know, and that's, these are things that are, are talked about in the framework document. And so we do value CUI's work in helping us um, perhaps foster more compliance and fostering compliance with the best management practices. So if we move, we'll go to the next. Um, so let's just give a bit of context and background. I mean, and this complements what Amanda was saying at the beginning. Excess soil is soil that will leave or has left a property or project area. Now, the new framework, um, in particular the proposed regulation that is spoken to as Action 1 of the framework, is intended to clarify the responsibility of source site owners for excess soil management to ensure that excess soil is properly managed and re relocated. And so, to achieve this, it is proposed or it's being considered that the excess soil regula regula regulation uh, and regulatory package would require an excess soil management plan for certain source sites to be prepared and require an excess soil plan to be uh, 
or require excess soil to be managed in accordance with that plan. So, again, as you can read about in the document, we've, we've con contemplated or raised the possibility of uh, requiring larger or riskier, quote unquote, source sites to, to require plans. Uh, we're thinking through what that means. To set requirements for those plans, including the standards for reuse and the requirements for sampling, and to require the tracking and registration of excess soil movement. So the, the idea being that you would, that the source site would think in advance about record keeping and how soil movements are to be tracked. Uh, Geneva was talking about uh, GPS. These are certainly ideas under the, uh, that, that are, you know, worthy of considering. And we've talked about, you know, uh, again in the framework about a registration of some sort. Uh, it's something that we're still thinking through, but uh, perhaps tying that to the requirements to, for the soil management plan. And then the excess soil management plans would be certified by a qualified person. And, and of course, that is to bring the, the, the decision-making ability to bear on those plans. Um, and the proposed new regulation would define who is and the role of such qualified persons. And of course, it may build upon the definition of qualified persons in OREG 15304. So that is the Record of Site Condition Regulation, AKA the Brownfields Regulation. And if you look in sections five and six of that regulation, you can uh, see who, who has been designated a qualified person in the Brownfields redevelopment regime. Um, so this is just a very high level summary. Again, want to congratulate CUI on their work. You can see that we're hard at work on the range of actions in the framework. There's actually 21 actions. Again, uh, I've only talked about about five or six, I think, in total here. Um, so, you know, um, there, there is more to read there. Uh, our next steps here are to continue meetings of the excess soil engagement work of sub-working groups. Now, you'll remember that I said that we had formed some sub some working groups. Um, it's possible that some members of, the, are, of those groups are um, on our call, so thank you very much to those folks. Uh, those are folks that are helping inform our, our work. Um, there's also development of our regulatory proposal, and again, that's underway. That's the real, you know, those are the, some of the key actions in the framework, doing a regulation, complementing it by uh, amendments to the uh, waste regulation and the Ontario Records of Site Condition Regulation. Um, you know, so that's currently underway. We're, we're hoping um, that this winter, we might still get onto the EBR. The, um, and by the way, for those who don't know, the EBR is the Environmental Registry. That is an online website unto itself, not to be confused with our Excess Soil Management Registry. That is an idea under contemplation. The Environmental Registry is a place where, of course, we post uh, proposals for environmental policy. And so we're hoping to go onto the Environmental Registry, AKA the EBR, this winter still. Uh, looking at having a potential final regulation posted, so again, we would post the final regulation on the environmental registry, in this case, as a decision notice, hopefully this summer, and then a potential final regulation in effect in 2018. And so these are all potentials because, you know, while the intent has been signaled, um, you know, these have to go through policy approval processes. So very much appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we can see that the bylaw language tool is a critical piece of the receiving site regulation. What I have talked about just now mainly is focused on the source site, but we, we see the importance of the, the receiving site as well and have a range of actions under the receiving site portion of the framework. So um, I'm not Laura. Laura is my colleague, Senior Policy Advisor for Land and Water Policy Branch. Uh, you can reach her uh, uh, and uh, at that content information, or you can reach me if you have any further questions, comments, anything uh, about this stuff at uh, the contact information there. And you know, we do we have valued the the, the uh, input we received. I think that the attendance on today's website webinar is really indicative of the interest, and and so you're welcome to contact us anytime. Okay, well thanks so much Sanjay. That's uh, helpful to fill out the, the context here. Um, obviously the, the soil management picture involves both stores and receiving sites and it's good to, to bring that together in the conversation. Um, so if you have any questions from what you've heard um, for the bylaw tool or for Sanjay, please feel free to type them in. Um, we'll have a few minutes to answer questions and we've received a couple so far. So we'll, um, the three of us here will, will try to respond to those. Um, the first question we received was, has the BMP been updated since 2014? 
Um, so the answer is uh, no, the, the BMP has not been updated, but the uh, Excess Soil Policy Management Framework uh, has and was just finalized at the end of last year, as Sanjay was talking about, and uh, the Ministry has a lot of ongoing work, as Sanjay was talking about, but the BMP was issued in 2014. Um, the next question here I see, will this be, tool be expanded to include Northern Ontario? Um, as I mentioned, there is certainly an aspiration to uh, expand this tool. Um, this first phase, as I mentioned, really focused around Toronto and the GTA because um, a lot has been in the media and a lot has been happening uh, around soil movement around Toronto and the, the huge amount of construction happening here. But uh, we would like to expand it to the rest of the province because that is the, the province's mandate. Um, so that would be ideal. Okay. Um, so there's a question about uh, do site alteration bylaws, um, sorry, just reading here. Uh, so site alteration bylaws cannot extend into conservation authority regulated areas. The province is repealing this. What effect will this have on uh, CUI's work? Um, so I guess I can give an answer and maybe Sanjay can add to that. But um, we knew that this work was happening as we uh, developed the bylaw tool. Um, so we did not address conservation authority uh, regulated lands. So that's a pretty simple answer. Um, we put the conservation authority regs on the website, but um, we didn't specifically uh, go into any detail there. Right. So, so Amanda is action eight of the framework. Action seven of the framework is the uh, is that policy amendment that has in fact been put forward. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's been introduced. So, um, basically, the effect is that the site alteration bylaws will apply in CA regulated areas. What we heard and what's described in the framework is this limitation because. Under the Municipal Act, C municipalities have some powers to regulate things that aren't within the purview of CAs. So the whole idea is to have these site alteration of bylaws apply in municipalities that are covered by CA regulated areas. And in, indeed, I, I would I mean the intention is to enhance soil management by allowing municipalities to have regulation over those things that they have purview of. Um, you know, and, and, and yeah, so it's basically. The intention is to improve soil management uh, by allowing municipalities to act in broader geographies. Okay, thanks, Sanjay. Um, there were a couple of questions we received about conservation authorities, so I think um, we'll give that as an answer for the, the couple of questions we've received. Um, a question here, is there a way to contribute to the bylaw website? Um, or contribute a bylaw to the website, uh, absolutely. So please contact us through the website or we'll have my contact information at the end. And yes, if, um, we'd love to have your, your bylaw added. Um, okay, um, there was a question we received about, when Geneva was talking about the traffic and transportation management plan, uh, about managing traffic uh, managing transportation from outside the municipality because, as we know, um, soil often originates from a source site that's outside the municipality and what's the, the practice for managing that. Um, so a, a quick answer is the, the BMP says that the traffic and transportation management plan should start at the source site. So it should include the uh, entire haul route. And as well, um, the bylaw can require the applicant to consult with both upper and lower tier municipalities. Um, outside the municipality, I think it would be a, a best practice to consult with other jurisdictions. Um, we did hear in our consultation some issues with, um, you know, municipalities not coordinating on haul routes. And um, unfortunately, I'm not aware of a way to compel municipalities to cooperate on that issue, but we would certainly recommend it. Um, so that would be my answer to that question. Okay, the next question is, if material is being reused on site and not traveling off site, does the soil need to be screened for on site use under the field guidelines? Uh, I'd have to double check the field guidelines to see what it says about that, to be honest. But with regards to the, to the uh, policy, um, with regards to the policy that we are developing, this is absolutely an issue that's being contemplated. We'd have to go and double check the, um, the, the, um, the BMP. What I do recall is that there is a check for, you know, like an olfactory check and so forth. Um, I have to double check for that. But we are able, I, 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 we are able to, 
Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and if your question uh, wasn't answered satisfactorily or you want to follow up, please send us an email and we can give you a more detailed response following the webinar. We're just trying to rapid fire answer as much as we can right now. Yeah, I mean, that, that, this is literally only a few minutes to answer because I can check the BMP, but I would prefer to do that part after the webinar just to allow as many people to answer questions as possible. Sure. But it's a great question. Okay. Another one about salt content here. Um, yeah, so basically the BMP, um, you know, is what it is, but uh, th this is an issue that is being significant, like that's being contemplated for excess soil. And that was relating to the soil that is high in salt content. Okay, uh, if a permit is under the Municipal Act is required, unsure why the interface with the building code. Um, these are quite distinct, you know, pieces of, well, they're both regulation. The building code is technically a regulation. These are quite distinct things, actually. Uh, building code is when you come in and you ask for a, a, a building code. What we have contemplated in action two of the framework, so it's more, one is about receiving sites, really, and one is about source sites. When you come in and ask for a permit, a building permit, um, what we are thinking about, and it's just as, as just to quote the framework here, it's something just being explored, is to require essentially um, showing the building official a letter from the qualified person certifying an excess soil management plan has been completed. What this has essentially been created, I mean, I do want to point out in answering that is that, so those are two different things. One is about receiving sites, one is about source sites is the simple first answer. Secondly, I do want to point out that the whole idea is you are complying with a potential law that would already exist. So it's, it's about fostering, it's really about fostering compliance. Um, okay, and then we had a question about whether the slides will be available online, and yes, they will. This is also being recorded, so we will put the recording of this up, um, and you can rewatch it. And also, basically anything that Amanda and I spoke about today, you can find on uh, the bylaw tool website, accessoils.com. So we have another question, um, which was in terms of the policy framework, uh, including the hiring of a QP and the development of an RSC for, for a site seems onerous, both in terms of time and financial impacts. Did the MOECC consider the impact of these costs in development of the framework? Yes, and absolutely. Um, I mean, I do want to point out that the uh, framework is a signal about policy development. And a, and a direction. We are working on the more rigorous details of such a policy um, and um, basically basically we would take that into consideration. I think the whole idea is that as we go through policy committee, we would think through the impacts on the regulated community and that's something that's well taken as a comment right now. Okay, we had um, a question on uh, truck tracking um, and the trucking log. So would it be required to make a trucking log valid for audit or, or what would make it required? Are any records okay? Basically, how can you trust the reports you are getting? Yeah, so the, the, challenge, the trick here is, is that some of these, these things are just things that are being debated uh, in our office. But, uh, but do you mind actually if I, if I go back to this question? Um, yes. So thanks, Kevin, for that. Um, so in order to, what we are considering is what are the rightful components of um, of these logs, uh, you know, we we talked about the the uh, tracking at both the like we we're basically considering having record keeping at a at a truck level and maybe more detailed record keeping. Um, I, I can't answer that question except to say that these are things being considered. Um, a question, if questions are answered offline, could these answers be distributed to all participants? Um, we are wanting to provide some kind of summary of, of what we've discussed today, so we'll take that request into account and, um, yeah, see what's possible to issue. Okay, so then we had another question about um, what is the current or proposed appeal mechanism for those opposed to a site being used for access well received? Current mechanism. So one of the things that we've talked about is, so first of all, with the permits, there may already be in a number of things an ability to, in a number of the, the permits, and I'd have to point maybe, maybe you know, um, more about the current permits and what they might say for receiving sites. 
Uh, certainly one thing that we, are, we have talked about in the framework is with these excess soil plans having some level of agreement. It's again something that's being talked about, but I take it back to our office as something that's important. This idea that there has to be um, you know, some level of agreement, it, it's a policy issue for us to continue to work on. So what I primarily take out of this question, and thank you for the question, is that you know, some degree of agreement between um, the source site and the receiving site. We're, we are thinking through, literally as we speak, because I had, was in a meeting yesterday uh, where some of these things were talked about, um, the, a, a, about what that means. And um, just one other thought on that is if you're referring to, I guess, someone else in the community opposed to a site being used for excess soil receipt, um, then the, the practice to have public consultations and allow for the public to input and raise their concerns with the site um, is in the BMP and is a recommendation of a bylaw. So to be able to capture those concerns and with a site and hopefully address them. Yeah, actually, if you don't mind me adding to that, so elements from the BMP, of course, I'm, I'm rem remembering as we talk. Um, the BMP, of course, talks about the soil management plan on the source site and a fill management plan on a receiving site. Of course, the contemplation is that there would be agreement there between the source and receiving. I mean, you wouldn't have a plan on both sides if, if that wasn't to be the, the best management practice. Um, so there's a question, will there be a specified deadline for municipalities to update or conform their fill slash site alteration bylaw? Um, so I, I'm not aware of any requirements for site alteration or fill bylaws. Um, this tool, and one of the reasons why the Canadian Urban Institute, I believe, was asked to create this tool is, is that um, we are an independent organization and, and we've taken what's in the BMP, which are guidelines, and provided suggestions for how municipalities might update bylaws. But there is currently, to my understanding, um, no uh, legal requirements for municipalities to update their bylaws, just best practices that we're, we're trying to help with. The next question is, it's tough to test every single load. Will the regs consider a prohibition on receiving sites that are within wellhead protection areas, WAPA A specifically, and, and, and those within the Clean Water Act are, are, are quite sensitive areas. We understand that. Um, in the event that a bad apple load of fill gets through. So these are, I, I mean, I will take this question back. These are absolutely things that are being talked about and considered. Um, we, are, we are thinking about, about that. It's hard, again, I. It, these are things that are being debated, and but one thing that is being debated, I will say, is a higher level of uh, a higher level of consideration at the source site and potentially the receiving site for these sensitive features. So I just want to point out that these um, that Clean Water Act, like features defined in the Clean Water Act and other sensitive features, are within our view screen, if you will. Okay, I think we've got through all the questions here. We're just flipping through. Um, okay, I think we'll, we'll cap it there. So we've almost used the uh, in, entire hour. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, for your input. Uh, thanks, Geneva. And uh, thank you to all of you. Um, as I mentioned, we'd, we'd love to hear from you as you get into the tool and uh, have questions or comments. Um, we want it to be usable, we want it to help municipalities, and so we'd love to hear um, any suggestions you have. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for other webinars and events uh, the Canadian Urban Institute has coming up. So thanks so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>